So, the second speaker of the session is going to be Frank Becker. Frank Becker has been developing Linux systems for more than 10 years. He specializes in the field of testing and benchmarking. Since 2013, he is working for Amazon Web Services, and I see a couple of Amazon t-shirts in the room, so, wow. Frank also has held tutorials and talks at the German PyCon about IPython and Django. In his spare time, which by his own accord is very rare, he is producing the German-speaking podcast Import This. Today, Frank is going to introduce the lib Butto, which makes it very, use, very easy to use AWS from Python. Please welcome Frank Becker with Managing the Cloud with a few lines of Python. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for your interest in, in this talk. Um, we already lost four minutes, so I really have to skip through the stuff here. Um, as I'm already was kindly introduced, uh, I work for AWS since uh, 2013, so that's one and a half years now. Um, I'm with the operating system group, which is based in Dresden, 200 kilometers south of, of where we are right now. Um, we're desperately looking for talent, so in case you're interested in something like this, uh, please talk to us. We have a booth downstairs, um, but we also have, I mean, all over Europe uh, locations, development centers where we have a lot of very, very interesting work. And yeah, if you especially like to work at scale, that's probably a good opportunity. Um, I've been working with Python since about uh, version 2.4. Um, yes, I, as already mentioned, uh, we actually put some effort into uh, this podcast here. Uh, a friend of mine, Marcus, who had to talk earlier uh, about Sphinx localization. Um, and he already promised that, uh, yeah, in the next couple of weeks, there will be some new episodes. Um, but back to the, to the talk. The idea for the talk, I actually got a uh, local little Linux conference where I was talking to a couple of Debian developers. And they said, look, we get those AWS credits. And actually, those guys at least didn't have any idea what to do with them, which is sad because, you know, AWS is giving it out. For, for them to, to improve Debian, and uh, I think they can use that. So we had a little chat, and well, sure, as many of you probably also, uh, they didn't fancy to click through web applications to launch instances and wh whatnot. So they asked, I mean, how can we automate that? And they also had some Python background, so I introduced both of them, and well, I had the feeling like this is something that's also helpful for others. Um, before we actually uh, talk about about Boto, two other little things. The first one is, uh, you know, humans like abstractions. So this word cloud is kind of a buzzword. Uh, well, let's say at least uh, different people have different opinions what it really means. So I define it for this talk only. You know, maybe in half an hour I will have a different opinion. Um, what I mean by that is that you have dynamic or in AWS speak elastic IT resources that can be some like storage, that can be some like compute, so virtual hosts, um, that can be networking. So if you need a content delivery network, it's just there waiting for you. But it also could be some routing stuff, packet filters, what we call uh, security groups. Um, you can have easily databases, um, as I will show you in a sec, uh, messaging systems. And the key here is that you can scale up and down those things. And while you scale up, sure, you have to pay more, but when you scale down, the idea is you don't pay anything uh, for all the stuff you don't use. Um, and well, as mentioned previously, uh, that has to be scriptable because nobody really wants to do that all by hand. Um, and Python, I believe, is, is a perfect language to, to do so. Um, if you now think, well, I want to write my hundreds uh, S3 uploader, um, there's a tool for that already. <laughs> Actually, uh, also Boto comes with a command line tool for that, but um, I would recommend the AWS 
CLI tool, which is also written in, in Python. Uh, and yeah, there's a different talk for that. So, you know, if all you need really is actually uh, fits in a, in a simple shell script, then maybe Boto isn't, isn't uh, the thing. Then you might be much faster using that one. Um, so, uh, Boto, actually. Um, Boto was uh, started by this guy, Mitch Garnett. He um, also used to work for AWS, but he left the company, unfortunately. So now the project is managed by, by AWS, which means uh, we make sure that you know the code is up to date, uh, but actually we also are very, very happy about contributions. So I checked on GitHub last week, so we had nearly 400 contributors to the project. Uh, we had over 6,000 commits, and that is just the GitHub history from somewhere in, in 2010. Um, yeah, and the name actually comes from this uh, little dolphin here. Um, which brings me to the first example I want to show you. So maybe uh, many of you are familiar with the storage service called S3, sample storage. Um, the idea is that you can dump uh, stuff in well, what we call uh, buckets. You also could think of it like a namespace or a directory. And there you have to create a key that you can have your objects back and attach to this key, you have an object, and this can be a stream of whatever. So it can be files or, well, as I said, whatever. Um, what we make sure is that you actually get your data back. So the term for that is durability. And what AWS guarantees you is that you get 99.999, and that's really nine times 9% uh, of uh, chance that you, that you really get your data back. And if you look up what your hard drive uh, gives you and then you do some calculation with some rate arrays, uh, you will see that's hard to reach, to reach this number. Um, I dare to do live demos. Um, I have a couple of iPad notebooks uh, <laughs> prepared. I just have to see if, because we had a little problem with setting up the, the display here, if that works. So what you basically do is, in the first place, you input Boto. Can you see the mouse pointer? Good. So I execute that. Done. Um, I have a little file on my, on my hard drive called Dolphin JPEG. Um, so what we do here is we first try to create a bucket. If that fails, uh, we just connect it. Um, and then we, as I mentioned, we have to create a key for the object we, we want to upload. And this key yeah, is called uh, Dolphin JPEG. And then we just uh, upload the content. So let's do that. This little star here turned into two. So it's done. And yeah, that's some IPython magic. So we generate actually, uh, what we do here is we get this, this bucket again. Um, we go through the list of keys, um, which is not really so much relevant here. But uh, actually, this line here then generates a URL that is valid only for 120 seconds. So what you can do is, of course, you can generate URLs that are valid forever. But sometimes you just want to share a file and you do not want, you know, that others uh, download it too. So you just want to have valid, uh, just want to have this link being valid for a certain amount of time. And that is what this thing does. So and if all goes well, and it does, uh, you actually see the, the signature for this, for this uh, attached to this URL, and well, we downloaded the, the file. Um, who of you knows how to create torrent files with AWS? Torrent, you know, BitTorrent, the uh, thing that the music industry got a little wrong. Uh, <laughs> but actually a very helpful protocol. Wait, then let me do this bigger. I 
prepared that already. Um, you may not remember uh, that I gave you this link here, down here for this presentation. And, sorry, and this, uh, of course, also comes from S3. So the only thing you do actually is uh, you attach to your S3 link, question mark torrent, and what you get is the torrent file. So with the limitation of the, of the wireless we have here, I'm not sure if uh, clients here can talk to each other, but uh, that would improve downloads like this uh, a lot. Um, OK. Next example, I talked about this uh, message queues. The service is called SQS. What it basically does is, and there are many other implementations of that, uh, you just dump a message in, in a queue, and somewhere else you take it out. That's the basic uh, concept. Very useful in, in distributed systems. Um, and, well, as I mentioned, there are many open source projects that this is kind of the same thing, but if you want to have that scalable, if you want to have that in a high availability, uh, you will find out it's not so simple anymore to set it up, and actually it also can be quite costly if you have to distribute the service and stuff. So, uh, with Boto, it's quite easy to, uh, to do that. Um, let me go to the iPython notebook. Again, I'll try to make it a little bigger. So, this time we use the SKS uh, module out of Boto. We create a connection to, uh, this is always uh, per region, so we, we go to uh, the European region from AWS, where we use the service. We create a queue, which we, which we label EuroPython 14. We set a timeout, I come to that in, in a bit. And wait, just let me execute that. First one, second one, and in the next block we actually add a message. So we import uh, the message class, um, we instantiate one, and we set the body as I'm a genie in queue. And we write that to the, to the queue. We uh, created before. So now let's assume we are somewhere else on a, on a totally different system. We uh, create a remote queue. Um, we get all the messages. We print the message body. And we print the queue count. So I executed it again. I mean, I tested that before. That's why uh, we started there. Um, yeah, of course, we get the we get the, uh, the message, I'm a genie in the queue, and we also get uh, a queue count of zero. So now we wait a little, actually this timeout, and we see again how many queues, uh, how many messages we have in this queue. And big surprise, now it's one. So the idea there is that if for whatever reason your service that was actually dealing with the message and receiving, I don't know, a chunk of JSON and doing something, uh, that failed for whatever reason, it crashed, or, then you do not actually want your message to be gone forever. Uh, you want actually the service then, when it dealt with a message, uh, to delete it. And that's actually the last block. So you just say, again, you, you get the messages, uh, you iterate over them, and you delete them. Done. So you get, for one deleted message, a true. And, uh, Next time, it's empty. Um, that was example two, SKS. Um, now let's launch a virtual instance. Um, that brings me to the next iPad notebook. Um, again, we this time import the EC2 module out of Boto. Uh, let's actually do it that you also see which kind of uh, help Boto is, that you, you, know, you do not have to generate all this uh, APE, XML stuff and, and URLs for yourself. Uh, this time we enable logging. So what I basically do is I input logging uh, and set the 
the log level to, to debug, which uh, both will pick up. I again create a connection. Um, now I have debugging and Boto actually tells me that it found uh, the config. Uh, I didn't touch that. There are several ways how I can put in your uh, AWS keys. And in case some of that should show up, uh, I have temporary keys for this presentation. So um, in case you want to reuse them, don't try. Uh, so, and actually all it takes to, to actually run this instance now is this command, or this line. Uh, I have to say this uh, parameter, the first parameter is the actually image we want to launch. So the, the term there is army, Amazon machine image. Uh, and that really defines what you actually get if you get a Linux system, what Linux system, uh, what's being installed there. So as I mentioned earlier, Oh, did I forget that? Probably I forgot it. So we actually have our own Linux distribution where we make sure that it runs best on, on AWS. It's called Amazon Linux. But you also can have Red Hat, SUSE, Debian, or, or whatnot. Again, too. Um, so uh, the thing here to notice is you, that's actually all this thing uh, now Boto generates for us uh, to launch it. So you will have the, I come to availability zones in a, in a, in a bit, but we have a kernel ID and, well, security groups and all that. The architecture, root devices, uh, we don't really have to have the time to, uh, to get into that, but the thing now is uh, since that thing is launched in really a couple of seconds and, and then actually the, the system boots and that is kind of the handoff from us to, to you as the customer uh, when we do not touch it anymore and when we don't really know if your instance really boots up or not. So there is a service for that to monitor that, of course, but uh, that's not default. So what you get back in that case is a so-called reservation ID, which you can use actually then later on to see if your instance is turned to the state running uh, and which instance ID it got. So every virtual host or instance, same thing, uh, gets an ID, of course, that you can find it back. And that is what uh, will change here now. Uh, it's logging really. Mm. Right, we can. Yeah, uh, that's why I don't do live demos. Um, well, then I show in the slides. Uh, in that example here, I actually get back uh, four of those instances, and yeah, and once I have the the object for this instance, I have a couple of, of methods like I want to have the public DNS name, or as you see uh, later on, I also can uh, terminate those instances then or check them or whatever. Um, that for this, uh, wait. Before I actually can start with the, with the next example, I have to introduce a few concepts, the so-called so uh, virtual private cloud, which roughly you could uh, say is a LAN, but just in the cloud. So I already talked about regions, so a region is really you know, data centers at a geographical point. Um, that is divided into so-called availability zones, which means if you want to have a, a available service, you will launch in different availability zones, and if one goes down, then you are at least ensured that the other one uh, will still be up and running. That's the idea behind that. and. And then you, you want to have, at least in a, in a VPC, you want to have your own network in there. You do not want to see traffic from our management or from other customers or what, whatever. Uh, and therefore, you basically launch uh, with private 
IP addresses, you have subnets in there, the subnets are per uh, availability zone, and if you want to have those uh, instances exposed to the internet, you can always attach a public IP address, and they're visible again. Or you can go through this internet gateway and router, and you know there are different things like load balancers and stuff you can use here. Um, it's important for what I want to do now. So uh, this example actually shows how to just launch 10 of those uh, hosts, 10 instances, um, install this CC uh, and all the stuff you need to, to build a Linux kernel, um, set up this CC, and then this CC has a functionality where it actually can broadcast and find other, other nodes, and then you can compile. Um, I'm afraid we do not have the time to, to really show that because the launches and all that uh, takes a little. Um, so let me just show you quickly. Oh great, now Firefox doesn't want to work. I'll have to back up. Um, what you basically do is, uh, that here is important. Uh, this time you say I don't want to have just one instance, I want to have 10. That's this uh, thing. Uh, you say explicitly which instance type you want to have. So C3 X large has a little bit of compute power. Uh, you have to give a subnet. I talked about it earlier. Um, we want to have monitoring this time. And yeah, well, that's done. You get a couple of instances. I used uh, Fabric to you know, SSH into them, install the stuff. Uh, start the CC. Uh, well, it's Again, done with, with Fabric, uh, I actually kick off the, the compile. And after, after uh, a little less than two minutes, the whole thing was over. And I actually can shut down everything and, and done. Um, I very quickly uh, skimmed through the, the last example where you could say, well, but maybe 10 instances is a little bit too much, so I want to have this more flexible. Let's say you have a compile service or something. Uh, the key there is uh, another tool called Autoscale. Um, what it basically is, uh, you have a so-called launch configuration where you define you know, the instance size of your virtual host, uh, which arm you want to use, and all that. Uh, you need a so-called autoscaling group which defines the availability zones, for instance, uh, the minimal size of your, of your cluster, the maximal size, uh, and yeah, this launch configuration that is all started. When you kick this off, you could imagine that uh, now there are four instances being launched, and that is exactly what you see on the bottom of the slide here, with the get activities method. Um, Uh, then you have to have a, a scaling policy for scaling up and down. Uh, you have to kind of triggers or alarms uh, for that, and you and that's done here in those alarms. You give it a threshold for CPU utilization, uh, which have to which has to trigger for a certain amount of time. So that's twice 60 seconds, and if this triggers, then uh, it actually scales up by, that's this parameter up here, by one instance. And this would go on and on uh, until you reach the, the eight instances. All right, and well, to shut this whole thing down, again, three lines of Python. Well, I'm through my slides. Um, actually, for all the services you see here, uh, Boto is the API, or is, is the tool to use. Thank you. We got, thank you, thank you a lot, Frank. We got time for one very quick question. One question. Okay, then okay. I give you, I give you may, the answer. May I, may I ask a quick question? <laughs> yeah. How long would it take me to set up um, a service running on Boto from scratch? Well, it's really, uh, well, you have to click an AWS account which means some verification that you are who you claim you be. Uh, 
and from there you get an, an, a key. So you have to configure Boto, that's just two strings or two keys uh, you have to give it as a shell variable or whatever. And then, yeah, you use one of those lines here and you're up and running. Okay. Thank you a lot. Let's thank the speaker again and prepare for the next talk.